Bloomberg. I'm Eric Schatzker, and welcome to Bloomberg's Front Row. Today, I'm talking to Don Fitzpatrick, Chief Investment Officer at Soros Fund Management. She oversees $27 billion for the legendary George Soros, money he uses to fund his philanthropy. Soros himself was among the most fearless and feared hedge fund managers. Dawn is determined to rekindle that ambition and to shake her reputation for being conservative. When there is a dislocation, um, we're, we're prepared you know, to, to not, not just double down, but triple down when the facts and circumstances support that. Dawn is among the most powerful and influential women on Wall Street. This is what's on her mind where to invest as the world emerges from COVID-19. The right way to think about ESG. The shocking way some corporate CEOs act towards Soros. Leveling the playing field in finance. Here's my conversation with Don Fitzpatrick. Don, Soros Fund Management is the greatest name in macro investing. A name synonymous with fearlessness and audacious trades. This, after all, was the hedge fund back in the day that broke the Bank of England in 1992. But the words people use to describe the firm today include conservative, safe, and unambitious. Has Soros lost its appetite for risk? Absolutely not. You know, back in the spring of, of 2020, we put over $4 billion to work into the dislocation. When there was a buyer strike, we, we were the provider of liquidity um, and that's, that is not being conservative. We lean into dislocations. And I think if you look at our returns over the tw last 12 months, again, they speak to um, really taking advantage of an opportunity set and leaning in. And the other thing I'd say is when you look at the asset management industry generally, um, a lot of the big platforms that can trade across asset classes have mechanistic stop losses, whereas one of the things the team and I've really focused on is making sure that when, when there is a dislocation, um, we're, we're prepared you know, to, to not, not just double down, but triple down when the facts and circumstances support that. So if the returns prove otherwise, what are they like? So over the, over the last 12 months, uh, we're up just shy of 30%. Um, and we have performed both in private and public markets. And, and again, I would put our, our returns and the quality of the returns we produced up against any asset manager or at any hedge fund. The team did a great job executing. And again, we played our own game versus playing kind of the, the game that everyone else can play. So if conservative, safe, unambitious are the wrong words to describe Soros Fund Management, how would you characterize it? What are the right words to use? So, so th this platform is just incredibly differentiated, I think, from any other pool of capital in the world. Um, and I think really what we've been focused on is our competitive advantages. And, and, and by the way, there, there are a lot of them. First of all, you know, in the asset management industry, most investment mandates are very, very tightly defined. And usually you have hundreds, if not thousands, of clients and you kind of have to play to the lowest common denominator. Um, versus at SFM, we have $27 billion of effectively permanent capital. Over 90% of those assets are the Open Society Foundations. Um, so we can invest anywhere, any asset class, and connect the dots across those asset classes and be extraordinarily nimble um, when there's a dislocation but also, we can invest, we can hold an asset in perpetuity. Most private assets have to have an exit in five to seven years. We, we, we can be a, a, a holder that's, that's incredibly long term. Um, so, so this platform is really, really unique. Um, and what we've tried to do is play to those advantages. Give me an example. What are, what's one of those differentiated investments could be something bold and daring or could be just something you wouldn't see anywhere else so so in march um when really what the once kind of unimaginable was happening um and you had mortgage REITs being forced sellers and de forced deleveraging 
we were able in a matter of, you know, 48 hours bid on multi-billion dollar portfolios. We could underwrite them, we could fund them, um, and, and buy them. And again, it's a moment in time, post the financial crisis, the amount of capital that can be that nimble is just significantly smaller. Bank balance sheets are, you know, are, are, are very, very pro-cyclical. Um, so our ability to show up, show up in a big way, um, and make big bets, I think is, is very differentiated. Would you say you're as, having worked at a hedge fund yourself, would you say you're as nimble as a hedge fund can be? I, so I say, I think we are more nimble. So think about the biggest multi-strategy hedge funds in the world. They tend... The Citadels, the Millenniums, the point yeah. seventy twos. All of them, they run levered balance sheets and they t typically have very mechanistic stop losses. So they, they, they really are not built to lean into a March dislocation, um, at least not, not in the first or second inning, um, versus we really are built to do that in, 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 a, in a really different way. There's big sovereign wealth funds that can do it, but they're slow and lumbering, I would argue. Do you have return targets? No, so, I th so as an investor, I think return targets are a little bit dangerous, right? Because it, it, they, in the absence of a good opportunity set, you'll lever up at the exact wrong moment in time. That said, the foundation's spend on average is about one, one and a quarter billion dollars. And uh, because of COVID, 2020 and 2021 are above that level. Um, so the team and my goal is obviously to support that spend and help the foundation continue to grow those assets. Do you think of performance as an investor in absolute terms or in relative terms? So I think you have to think, look with both lenses, to be fair. As we shifted strategically to, to lean into those strengths, um, we, we gradually picked up momentum in terms of outperformance relative to peers and relative to benchmarks. So it, it, uh, 2020 was a good year for us, but it feels like the best is yet to come. You feel like the best is yet to come, why? The, the team has, has gelled in a way, I think that's really, really powerful. So instead of having a bunch of portfolio managers that are focused on maximizing their individual outcomes, we have a team that is truly focused on the aggre aggregate results we produce for the foundation. Um, and again, I think market structure, um, because of regulatory backdrop, has lent itself to being really, really rigid. So being able to be a provider of capital quickly and creatively is, is just increasingly valuable. Don, you arrived at Soros with a mandate to make changes changes that ruffled some feathers, made you a few enemies, and started rumors. What changes have you made and to what end? I wanted an internal team that was focused on that aggregate result and not individual self kind of optimization. Doing well what we could do internally, maximizing mind share, maximizing the ability to connect dots across asset classes, and then when it comes to our external allocations, really focusing on the managers who are, are truly differentiated. And there, as I said, there, there, there are some, but I think making sure that we had the right internal team and the right external partners was key. And I think, by the way, as a leader, I think everyone wants to be liked, but I've never needed to be liked. Um, and I'm, I, again, I think the team and I, the results speak for themselves. I, I think our strategy was the right one and it's paying dividends. There's a perception that the DNA has changed and it comes with a sense of resentment, even anger. Surprisingly, what explains that perception? So uh, there are definitely people who, who uh, uh, we're at the, on the losing end of some of the changes. Um, and, and I think, you know, those people aren't happy with what I did. 
Um, and I, I understand that. And it's, by the way, they're not bad people. They're not bad investment managers. They just didn't fit our strategy. Does the resentment and the fact that it persists after three and four years bother you at all? It, it honestly, it doesn't. Um, you know, I, I, I come from a big Irish family. I guess I have thick skin. Um, but but it, but it doesn't. I think that the you know the foundation, George, the board I report to, making sure they're happy, is important to me. It's important to the team, and that's really what drives and motivates us. You have twenty seven billion dollars you manage. How is it allocated? So um, uh, right now, about half of it, a little less than half, um, is in private assets. And the bulk of that is traditional private equity. The other, the other half is public markets. And again, that's, that's um, partially internal, about 75% internal, 25% external. I think people naturally gravitate towards privates because it, pre it prevents them from, in some ways, from, from, from buying high and selling low. Um, when, when you look at the data on, on private markets relative to public comps and beta adjust, on, this is the average, not the, the top decile managers. There's not as much alpha as, as people think there is there. Um, so, so from my perspective, you know, we like the opportunity set right now, right now more in public markets. And what we're seeing and I, is in some cases, private valuations are getting ahead of their public market comps. And I think people, I, I think you have to be a little bit careful of that. Um, and, and, and it's something that we're watching pretty closely. All that said, there are always going to be outstanding private companies and pri outstanding you know, private asset managers. Um, but, but right now, things on the private side feel frothy. And on the public side, we're seeing really good opportunities. Why do you think valuations on the private side are outstripping those on the public side right now? What explains that? Well, part of it is FOMO. <laughs> I, I, you know, there, there has been some extraordinarily, extraordinary wealth created on the private side of markets, and you see some, some of these valuations are incredible, and, and a lot of hedge funds have started to play the late private into public round. And that, by the way, that was an extraordinarily good strategy over, over the past 24 months. Um, so, so I think there's some FOMO. I also think COVID really accelerated some secular trends. So again, some of these valuations are warranted because things that would have taken five years have happened in the span of, of you know, 12 months. So you described some of the things that look appealing. Uh, broadly speaking, where are you taking risk? So again, um, Equity long short, we see, we see good opportunities there. On the credit side, as I mentioned, we had leaned into residential mortgages um, back in the spring of last year. We're actually slowly starting to lighten up on that, and we're starting to look at the commercial real estate in, from an opportunistic perspective. It so feels a little early on things like retail and office, but hotels are, are, are starting, to, starting to get interesting. Um, interestingly, on the, uh, the SPAC side, for a while, it, when it came to their pipes, it was you know, a, a, a seller's market and you had to take the terms. Now it feels like pipes are going to get done where the buyers can be smart structurers. And we think that could get very interesting when, when the, the target company is attractive. So the leverage, if you will, not financial leverage, but the negotiating leverage flips from the sponsor to the, the pipe investor. I think we're at that inflection point. Interesting. Do you have an especially high level of conviction, positive or negative, about strategies or themes? We think the whole infrastructure around crypto is really interesting. Um, and, and you know we've been making some investments into that infrastructure. And, um, and, and we think that is at an inflection point. I'd say it's, it's everything from kind of uh, exchange asset managers, custodians, to the mundane like tax reporting on your, on, on your crypto gains, um, you know, and everything in between. 
um, but I, we, think, we think that's interesting. So f when it comes to crypto generally, I think um, there, there are some, some, some important, we're at a really important moment in time in that something like Bitcoin might have stayed a fringe asset but for the fact that you know, over the last 12 months, we've increased money supply in the US by 25%. So there's a real fear of debasing of fiat currencies. Um, and, and when you think about Bitcoin, I don't think it's a currency, I think it's a commodity, but it's a commodity that's easily storable, it's easily transferable, it is, the IRS classifies it as a physical asset, it has a finite amount of supply, and that supply halves every four years. Um, so so I, think it's, I think it's interesting. And I think, by the way, when you look at gold price action in the context of a, a, a fairly robust inflation narrative of late, it's struggled getting traction. And I think that's because Bitcoin is taking um, some, some of its buyer base away. Do you own any Bitcoin? Uh, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> that is what I would call a mysterious response. Um, but I, I will say, when, the one thing also when you think about Bitcoin is central bank digital currencies are going to be here, I think, quicker than people expect. You know, China's been running their, their, their um, trial for a while now. And I think there's some strategic reasons why they are going to be a first mover. And I do think from a geopolitical perspective, they want to use that digital, digital currency to, um, they, they want that to be used around the world and it is a potential threat to other Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. I was just going to say, does that legitimize Bitcoin or does it delegitimize Bitcoin? So I think it, it is a real threat, but I think it will be temporary. I don't think they'll be successful in, um, in permanently destabilizing Bitcoin. I want to know how you think about leverage on the one hand and hedges on the other. Yeah, so I think um, so when you think about leverage, you want to think about it in the context of what is term leverage versus overnight leverage. And I think you want to think about it in, in terms of the assets you're, you're leveraging and the underlying liquidity. So if you, like going back to the mortgage REITs, if you think about what the trouble they got themselves into at, at the start of 2020, it was about having assets that ultimately weren't as liquid as they thought and not having, ha having term around those. And when that happens, you are a forced seller at the exact wrong moment in time. You get carted out. Yeah, 100%. Do you have any hedges on now? We do, um, absolutely. Uh, both, both on the rate side and on the public market equity side. Now, is that because you see the risk of a, if you will, a further deterioration in the rate market? You're hedged against higher rates on the long end? Actually, so, so when it comes to, to interest rates, absolutely. I think, um, while I don't think rates are going to get wildly ahead of us, it is a tail risk that you want to be aware of. And it, every other risk asset in your portfolio will perform badly. If, if that happens, like U.S. Treasury market should be the deepest market in the world and traditionally has been. But this year we've seen days when le liquidity was really genuinely challenged. And, you know, to me that that creates vulnerability and it creates an ability for 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 moves that are way and outsized relative to any given headline. We saw some of the th same things in the darkest days of the market meltdown in March of 2020. Not enough liquidity in the treasury market. What does that say? What's going on under the hood? So, so again, and it's interesting, um, a couple things. I think bank balance sheets and the restrictions on bank balance sheets matter. By the way, I thought it was really interesting that the, the Federal Reserve did not extend the sup supplemental leverage ratio. So I think, I think that matters. The fact that the, the Federal Reserve has been monetizing Treasury issuance over the past 12, 12 months also doesn't lend itself to liquidity in Treasury markets. Um, you know, it's almost like issuing a, a publicly traded stock and then, and then you know, having all the free float owned in one place. 
Um, so I think I think that also is is uh, is, is problematic. Is uh, is macro still a key part of the Soros playbook? So um, we have some great macro allocations. It, you know, our macro view does inform kind of our, our, our bottoms up, you know, stock allocations and, and, and factors like that. Um, but in terms of aggregate allocations to discretionary macro managers, um, it's significantly lower than it has been historically. So what percentage of the 27 billion in AUM is now allocated to macro? Uh, to back of the envelope. Um, Ballpark it. Yeah, it's probably like 5%. 5%. Once upon a time, it was 100. Yeah, it was a lot. A long time ago, though. <laughs> Don, you have said ESG matters a lot to Soros. Why? I think we can really affect behavior because we own things at the security level. Um, and I think that matters. Obviously, the foundation um, that that we manage money for um, is, and, and being aligned. The Open Society Foundation. The, yeah, and, and I should step back. So the Open Society Foundation is the single largest private funder of human rights initiatives in the world. Um, their mission is focused on um, transparency of information, government accountability, promoting democracy, equitable allocation of resources, and it's important to me and the team that, that the way we invest is consistent with their values. And as an investor, if you're not focused on these factors and these issues, I think you really risk being in stranded assets and being in assets where the cost of capital for those who aren't doing the right thing is going to ratchet higher at an exponential rate and vice versa for companies that are doing the right thing by society cost of capital is getting cheaper. For those trying to figure out how to think about ESG, what is the right way to think about it? Is it the right thing to do ethically? Is it a way to achieve progress or specific outcomes? Or is it just a way to hedge or mitigate externalities? What's the right way? So I think it's it's all of the above. First of all, you know, when ESG first came out, it was about you know, your ex exclusion list. That is not what ESG is about. From our perspective, it's about both creating the, the technologies that will allow a smooth transition. So investing in companies like, like Rivian and, and, and Battery and, and EV is really important to us. And then it's, it's also about taking your existing public companies and forcing a level of transparency, both in terms of greenhouse gas exposure, what their, their plan is to transition to net zero by 2050. Um, when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, again, shining a light, asking them to, to disclose um, what their company looks, looks like. And, from our perspective, the, the more transparency is, there is, the, the quicker the progress we will make. Do they listen? Do those companies listen? Do they answer? I know why they listen and answer to BlackRock, because BlackRock has $10 trillion. Do they listen and answer to you? I think they do, and I think we're trying to be partners. So we're not just saying, hey, check this box and we'll go away. We're trying to work with them um, in terms of credible plans. We're telling them why this is important to us, and for us, this really is about outcomes, not, not about checking a box. And I think they appreciate that. And, and I think every CEO or CFO we would talk to genuinely wants help on this journey. And, and, and um, I think we can be part of that. You believe Soros Fund Management has competitive advantages over other foundations, certainly, and over other asset managers. Does it also have constraints? Honestly, you know, the, the, uh, the only constraint I would say, but I don't think this is a, actually a constraint, but we won't invest with companies that we think are counter to the values of the foundation for which we, we invest. Um, but I actually think that's, that is a benefit, not, not a constraint. And tell me about the way you've organized the investment function. Uh, what you believe the firm should be 
doing internally and what you think is better sourced to ex external managers. When we think about an external manager, we um, want it to be someone who can do something better than we can do ourselves. So places that I've highlighted in the past, biotech, the best biotech managers in the world are just extraordinary at what they do. They have huge teams that, that, that really have persistent advantages. So we allocate externally there. The other places are the, the really highly levered firms. I, if I'm gonna be, ha have a lot of leverage, I'd rather do it off of our balance sheet and have it be effectively non-recourse leverage. So, 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 so that's a place that's, that's really interesting to us. Um, there, and then there are just some managers who are truly uniquely, uniquely talented. Um, and, and that's important to us. One thing that, that, I, that I think it's important for people to know is that fees in and of themselves, we don't object to. If a manager is extraordinary producing valuable returns, we'll pay what the, mar what the market commands. So we just allocated this year uh, $400 million to a manager where the performance fee is 30%. It's a manager who is very, very um, protective of their capacity, so they very seldom raise assets. Um, the, the, he has an extraordinary amount of money alongside us, and the whole time we were in discussions, he was focused on protecting the interest of his existing LPs. It was good alignment. We're, we're really happy to be a partner. We expect to be a long-term partner. How about you personally? Do you have a book you manage? I do. So uh, <laughs> I have a, a center book, um, and I love that. I, my whole career, I've, I've, I've run a book, um, and I think it's important. First of all, from a return perspective, it's where we upsize our, our kind of best ideas. Um, I think it keeps me connected to markets in a way that's, that's really valuable, um, and I, I love doing it. How big is it? Uh, right now, that book is, is reasonably large. Reasonably meaning? <laughs> um, it's, it's over a billion dollars. It goes without saying, George Soros is a living legend of the investment business. What's it like managing money for George? So I obviously admire George before I, 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 I had this role, but I have to say, being in this seat, my admiration for him has, has only grown. He, um, he is the most incredible aggregator and assimilator of information I have ever seen. And it is really easy to see why he, you know, is the best investor of all time. He's 90, um, he's still tireless, he's fearless. All that said, he spends the bulk of his time now focused on the work of the foundation, especially now when, when that work is so critical. He does, um, you know, he still has strong market views and he's not shy about sharing them. Um, and yeah, I feel lucky, to, I, I feel lucky to get them when he, when does he, he does. still put on trades? He's not active in the portfolio at, at a single trade level. Again, he's focused on the foundation side. To the degree that he's interested, what is he interested in? What do you find you and he talking about when he wants to have that kind of conversation? He, you know, it's, it's the trades that are predicated on a geopolitical view. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Are, are the ones that he, that he tends to... The foundation to, of his career. Yeah, and, and, and again, his, his insights and his ability to gather, gather information is, is pretty incredible. George is perpetually uh, the target of conspiracy theories. He's demonized by far-right extremists. You know all of this. Um, to what degree does that get in the way, impede anything that, that you and your colleagues do at Soros Fund Management? So, uh, you know, there have been IPOs where a corporate CEO has zeroed us from the book. Seriously? Yeah. Um, so that has... On the basis of political views? Yes. That said, I, I just have to believe more people than not view the work George does as a true benefit to society. And I think there are more times that it works to our advantage than to our disadvantage. I would be remiss in not asking you 
um, to name some of those companies that have <laughs> X'd you out of the allocation book. And by the way, I would love to, but I will not. I will refrain. <laughs> You're big on having people work closely to one another. Yes. How did you solve for that problem during the pandemic? <laughs> we are Zoom experts. And I have, a, uh, I have two dogs, and one of my dogs is constantly in the background of my Zoom. But we've done things like Zoom happy hours. And we, did, we, we have um, Zoom happy hours that are random five person at the firm mix. And those have been invaluable. Um, and something, by the way, that post COVID, I think I'm going to keep up. Because um, you learn. You think they really work? I do. And I, was, I would have been the biggest skeptic that they'd work. Um, but that you, you, you're on a Zoom, we have no fixed agenda, and you just learn really interesting tidbits about your, your colleagues. And sometimes, because it's a random group put together, there are people that in normal course you might not interact with. Um, it's been, that's been great. That said, I can't wait to get the team back together in person. You're hoping that once vaccines are ubiquitous, you'll have everybody back in the office. Yeah, we're gonna, get, we're gonna come back. Uh, again, I, I think one of our advantages is the sharing of information and being able to have conversations. You can do that over Zoom and over chats, but it's not the same thing as being able to like, you know, turn around and, 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 talk, and talk to the you know, portfolio manager you know, behind you. Are you still hiring? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think, again, we'll always be looking for good portfolio managers. I think the bar is very high. They have to be good managers, and they have to buy into our culture and our philosophy about a focus on the aggregate results we're producing for the foundation. And if they don't, don't bother? I don't care how good they are. Don, the playing field for women in finance still is far from level. Um, I can't say that from experience, but I can certainly see that it's the case. What do you consider the biggest obstacles to advancement for women? in finance or investing, whichever you prefer. Um, and what needs to change for those obstacles to disappear? So, so I think this is, this is a really important focus. And it's interesting, when it comes to women and other under, underrepresented groups in the asset management and financial industry, I think there's been a narrative, and especially around women, that it's about attrition. Um, McKinsey has done some, some of the best work in this area. And when you look at it, it's not, the data doesn't really say it's first. It's not people taking themselves out of the equation. Not first order. What, it, what the data shows is it's the first couple rungs in a person's career that are hard to get over. So um, for women, they are 24% less likely to get the first promotion than men, even though they enter the industry at the exact same rate as men. So one of the things we're, we're um, kind of committing to do, and we're not a huge organization, we're 200 people, but is to bring in women and other uh, underrepresented groups um, early in their careers and then foster them, not just, don't just bring them in as in, an intern or first year hire, but commit to fostering them over a multi-year progression to set them on a trajectory where they really can be future industry leaders and really commit to their success. But to be clear, it's about getting them over those first couple promotions. And ideally, I obviously want these candidates to stay at SFM, but one of the things we're committed to is if, there's a, if for their career, it's better they go somewhere else, um, we'll facilitate that, but we won't take, like, we'll still be vested in their success. Don, I read that uh, Blackstone approached you during a recent search uh, for an investment chief in their hedge fund business. Um, was that something you considered seriously? So first of all, when John Gray and Steve Schwartzman call, you're, you're going to have the conversation. Um, but I think this is the best job in the investment industry, bar none. Um, and I hope to be here a really long time. You ran investments at UBS Asset Management before coming to Soros. Would you ever go back to working for a bank? You know, I, again, I, I, I hope to finish my career out here at SF, SF, SFM. Well, there's quite a lot of that career left. <laughs> Hopefully. You're on the lists of all the most powerful and influential women in investing and in finance, deservedly. How do you think about wielding that power and influence? So I think there's a responsibility there. 
um, you know, one thing on those lists is, is I wish, like, I, I want to be on lists that aren't qualified by my gender, to be, to, <laughs> to be clear. Um, but I do think there is a responsibility. I'm part of an informal group of really senior women in this industry, and we get together um, a few times a year and, and, and do Zooms and other things as well. And we spend a lot of time thinking about how to do that. Um, and we work together. We, wa we, we watch each other's backs. We, we, we're sounding boards strategically for each other. Um, and, and candidly, that didn't exist a couple of years ago in terms of us creating this, this powerful network. Um, so I'm hoping there's more and more of that. And, and we're thinking about how to expand that and, and really watch out for the next generation of women. Don, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.